This is Jen. This is Kelsey. And you're listening to the first 50 pages. It's been a while. I'm so glad that we have found our way back to this project, Kelsey, and I'm especially excited about this episode. Oh, me too. Uh, We are going to be talking with New York Times bestselling author, Catherine Center. I have to clap, I'm so excited. (laughs) I discovered Catherine's books a few years ago, and I honestly have to say that she is one of my favorite authors. Catherine writes about finding joy in the struggle and standing up to be brave and savoring moments of grace. So Catherine Center is the author of eight novels, including instant New York Times bestsellers, How to Walk Away and Things You Save in a Fire. Her novel, The Lost Husband, was just adapted into a movie starring Josh Duhamel, Leslie Bibb, and Nora Dunn and hit number one on Netflix this summer. And then her latest novel is What You Wish For. Catherine's novels are described as bittersweet comic novels. They are laugh and cry stories about how life knocks us down and how we get back up. And her books have made countless best of lists, including Real Simple's Best Books of 2020, Goodreads Best Books of the Year, and many, many more, including the coveted staff picks at the Sioux City Public Library. Welcome to the first 50 pages, Catherine. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. We are so excited to talk with you. Um, So this fall, I was driving out to our local apple orchard and I was at the end of the audiobook for What You Wish For. And I really enjoyed the book. Um, The narrator, Therese Plummer, she was fantastic. And I thought the story ended in a very satisfying way. I was just feeling really good about the whole book listening experience. It was a whole mood for me. (laughs) But it gets better because as I'm listening at the end, I'm expecting like my disc changer to move on to the next disc, but it kept playing and there was like this secret track at the end of the last CD. And it was completely unexpected and it was Uh, you, Catherine, reading your essay, Read for Joy. And I was completely absorbed in what you were saying. And a couple of times, I think I even said out loud, I was like, yes, you know, like, and then I listened to it again. Like once was not enough. I had to listen to it again. And then I started talking about it with everybody that I work with. Um, And of course, being librarians, they're loving it too. Um, And so... You know, I had to reach out. I, I had to talk to you about this essay because it really touched my heart. Um, it, it, because it's one of the things that Kelsey and I have talked about, um, me, you know, several times on our podcast about reading what you connect with and, you know, not being afraid to let go of a book if it doesn't speak to you and it's okay to, to quit reading. And that's kind of where part of our name of our podcast comes from, the first 50 pages, because we're like, if it doesn't grab you, let it go and find something that does. And um, so I'm, the question that I've been dying to ask you, um, you know, what inspired you to write this essay? Yeah, the essay is, and I don't want to sound too extreme by saying this, but it's kind of like the culmination of my entire life, basically. Um, I feel like I've been trying to figure out this essay since I was 12, probably, when I first fell in love with stories and all the magical things they can do for you as a reader. And I'm not even sure I'm done with it, you know? I think this essay is like my life's work, is to figure all this out. Um, And, you know, it's been a a kind of very (laughs) slow motion awakening for me, honestly as a reader because I I was always an English kid, you know, English class kind of kid and I loved words and language and rhythm and I, even as like a third grader I was like counting syllables of things and sort of listening to the rhythm of language and loving words. My third grade um, English teacher told us that if you used a word, a new word, three times it became yours. And I just fell in love with this idea and I got like obsessed with the idea of like collecting as many words as I could. Um, And I could go on and on with all these crazy examples, but I am certainly a person who has always loved reading, books, language, you know, all of it. And, um, but I think something happened to me in high school 
when um, reading started to become more of an academic subject than a personal pleasure. And um, I really got, um, I think I moved more into my head with reading and out of my heart. And for a long time, I thought that was just me. You know, I thought that I, I did that to myself because I wanted to be a writer and I was taking it all so seriously and I was turning it into work instead of play. But what's happened is I've become like a published author in the past decade plus, going around talking to book clubs and chatting with readers about books and what they love to read. Like the more I talk to people, the more I find that that's a super common experience. You know, it wasn't just me, like all of us who cared about books and cared about reading and uh, wanted to be good at that, to some level or another, seem to have absorbed some ideas about reading that pulled us outside of ourselves in this funny way, where reading kind of became about like external opinions less than like your own internal compass where you were kind of wanting to read like what would impress your English teacher, you know, you were just kind of making your judgments about books, not necessarily from your own heart, but from your educated mind. And so as an adult, I think a lot of my journey as a writer and as a reader has been to try to unlearn a lot of those biases and to try and give myself permission to read from the heart and to give myself permission to read what I want to read, what I feel drawn to. And the theory that I've kind of come up with after really thinking about this way too much is that um, I think if you let your heart guide you to the stories that you are interested in and compelled by and sort of long for, instead of the stories that you think you should want to read, um, that becomes an incredibly healing and nourishing journey. I mean, I think that stories basically can teach you lessons that you need to learn in your own life that you might not even realize you need to learn. You know, it can stories can answer questions for you that you don't even necessarily realize you need to ask. Really deep, deep, deep stuff. If you just trust yourself to be your own guide. Um, so yeah, that's become kind of my guiding philosophy on reading is that you should pretty much never read something that you don't want to read. Um, or if you do, it can be for other reasons, but really the way to let stories nourish your life the most, in my opinion, is to trust your own compass. And so for me, you know, that has taken me down many, many, many paths that I wouldn't have taken otherwise. Um, and I, once I kind of started figuring this out, I just wanted to like spread the word. I want, like, I actually went to a, um, a book club one time years ago and I was confessing to the book club that um, one of my favorite things to read was historical romance novels. That is still true. I love them. I mean, I eat them like candy. When I first discovered historical romances, I felt like a person who had spent her entire life eating boneless, skinless chicken breasts and I had just discovered chocolate cake. Like that's how much I love these books. And I, I, I said this to a book club. I now say it pretty frequently to book clubs. And um, this woman came up to me in the grocery store, like a couple of weeks later, she was like, you came to my book club and you, you gave us all permission to read romance novels. She was like, and I've been doing that nonstop ever since. And thank you so much. She was like, if Catherine Center can read romance novels, I can read romance novels. And I just thought, oh my God, look at this woman. Like. How much joy did I just offer into her life? Like she needed permission, right? As we all kind of do. And I think we see that on really a daily basis uh -huh. when, you know, people want to know what is a good book. They, they'll ask us, you know, what's a good book? What are you reading? And we always try and turn the conversation back to what is it that you're in the mood for? What right. is it that you want? Like, you probably don't want to read what I'm reading. Not that I'm not reading a good book, but it might not be what is going to, you know, touch you in the way that you need a story to. So let's talk about you, not me. Exactly. Um, that's exactly it. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, so the, where did the essay come from? That's, that's where it came from. It came from this life's work for my own self of trying to figure out what my own compass was about what I love to read. And I think that makes me a better writer. I think knowing what I love as a reader makes me a better writer. 
And then, um, and then, and then once I had kind of had this crazy epiphany about it, I just wanted to share it. Like, you know, I decided that my battle cry was going to be read for joy. And, you know, I made up some stickers. Like if you come to a book event for me, you're not going to get a, a bookmark. You're going to get a sticker that says read for joy. I've got one on my car. I'm just they a total are beautiful. Angelist. They are beautiful <laughs> stickers too. Thank I you. love them. They, they are joyful to look at. They're not just a sticker. They are joy. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So would you like me to read you like a little tiny piece of the, I would love, that? we would love it. Yeah, we'd okay. love it. All right. I'm going to do kind of a short one. Cause I don't know. It seems like a good idea. A few years ago at a party, I met a woman who was very embarrassed to confess to me that despite the goal she'd set for herself to spend the entire year reading all the works of Faulkner, she hadn't gotten very far. She winced with shame as she confessed, I just keep falling asleep. Oh, honey, I said, that's not your fault. That's Faulkner's fault. Then I leaned in and gave her a look. If he's not keeping you awake, he's not doing his job. There's a quote I love about writing by Dwight V. Swain. He says, a story is something you do to a reader. I think about that all the time. What do I want my stories to do to people? How do I want to make them feel? Because stories are, at their cores, emotion machines. They can make us laugh, make us cry, make us angry, make us fall in love, make our hearts sprint with fear. They distill human experience and capture its meaning and connect us to our humanity like nothing else can. They are the closest thing we have to magic. At the very least, they should keep us awake. But we tend to think it's our fault when they don't. I blame school. We all had to learn to read and do that at the mercy of adults who were watching us and judging us, even with the best of intentions. We all had to learn vocab words and take spelling tests and get graded on our reading comprehension. We all spent years and years in classrooms where we came to think about reading and stories through many lenses, none of them our own. I suspect a lot of people who loved to read as kids lost hold of that love as they grew up, as reading became more about achievement and grades and figuring out what the teacher wanted and less about pleasure and fun and play. I suspect that once reading becomes academic, it forces us to read from our heads instead of our hearts, but it's what we do from the heart that matters. When I talk about reading for joy, I'm talking about reading from the heart. When I talk about reading for joy, I'm talking about reading the stories you want to read rather than the stories you think you should want to read. I'm talking about a process of desnobification, of letting go of the idea that stories exist in a hierarchy with literary fiction up at the top and all other types descending down towards embarrassing. Stories aren't a hierarchy. Stories are a universe. Love it. Love it. Um, it, just, <laughs> it just makes me um, feel so good to hear, to hear that. Um, again, it's something that not only we talk about in libraries, just for all readers, for young readers, um, you know, we have talked about before, that is one of my um, favorite things to not only help people with, but to observe is the discovery of, um, you know, when kids are discovering books or, um, you know, even when adults will find something and then they come back and they say, I need more like this, you know, then it's like, we're on the right track. You know, when we, when we have them on that path where they are coming back for more, then it's like we have lit a spark. Um, one of the saddest things that I ever do is when someone comes in with a list of classics and they want to work their way through classics. And I just think that is a noble goal, but I don't think that you're going to connect with these stories in the way, you know, that you want to connect with reading. Um, and I, I, I love uh, somewhere, you know, you say, you know, read broadly. And so I love that. It's not that we aren't going to take time for the classics, but we have to take time for those things that connect with us. Um, and and I, I love that. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. 
an, another question that I have for you, Catherine, because I think a, a lot of people are like, yes, I want to read for joy. I want to, to read those books that I connect with. Now, how do I find them? Like, how do you find those books that, um, you know, give you joy? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's a process. Um, but I think uh, when I talk about reading widely, I think that's part of it. It's this idea of like sampling things, right? Try stuff and see what you like. Um, I really think uh, one big step in the right direction is to give yourself permission to read genre fiction. I think we, you know, I'm not knocking literary fiction. Most of my training was in literary fiction. It's got many good qualities, but it's not the only kind of fiction out there. And when I talk about a process of desnobification, that's what I'm talking about, right? Is giving yourself permission to read genre fiction. Because I think, you know, when you think about a mystery, that's gonna appeal to a person who likes to do a certain type of thing, right? A mystery is kind of like solving a puzzle and you get super absorbed in this process of solving a puzzle. My mom loves to work puzzles and she loves to read mysteries, right? Um, when you think about reading thrillers, like that's a certain type of emotional experience. You are, your heart is pounding with fear. You're being chased by the bad guy. You know, everything's on the line. The clock is ticking. You know, that's a type of emotional experience. And, you know, when you read romance novels, you get, I mean, that's my personal favorite. You get like a, you get like a simulated experience of falling in love, right? And, and I, I have a theory that when you sign up for that, what you really get um, is uh, all the good brain chemicals that you would get if you were actually falling in love, right? So you are reading a romance novel, you're reading about these other people, you're totally cheering for them, and your brain is just doused in oxytocin, and you're just walking around feeling happy. I mean, they're just mood elevators, right? And that's something that I love and I need. And I've always been a person who really responded very strongly to love stories. Human connection is like a huge thing for me. But I think there are people who need stories about courage. You know, there are people who need to read stories where they sort of vicariously step into the shoes of a point of view character who has to step up and be brave. You know, that could be a thriller. Maybe you need to read stories about um, not giving up right? Stories where people, where the odds are stacked against you and you, and you don't give up, you know, you're the guy jumping out of the helicopter, whatever it is. You know, the thing about stories that's so particularly uh, powerful and unique to almost anything else in the human experience is that they let us step into the shoes of the point of view character. And if the, if the writer has done their job, you're not just like walking through the plot of that story sort of with that character, if the writer's done a good job, you are going through that story like as the character, right? So you are empathizing so hard with this imaginary protagonist that you care about what they care about and you want what they want. And when they're happy, so are you. And when they're sad, so are you. And when they fall in love, so do you. You like merge with that person, right? It's the most astonishing act of human empathy. And doing that means that whatever lessons it is that that character is gonna pull out of their experience, whether it's you know, being chased by a alien from outer space or, or, or getting thrown into a snake bit by pirates, whatever it is, they're gonna pull some lesson. They're gonna learn something from that experience. And because you're right there inside them, you're gonna learn that lesson too, right? So in a way that is unique to anything in human life, you know, that just makes textbooks pale by comparison. Novels teach us things. And they teach us essential life lessons about how to be human and how to live. And so that's why it's so important to find the ones that speak to you. Um, so when you step out of the story, you come back to your own life with new wisdom. And the stories that are gonna speak to you the most are the ones that you like. If it feels interesting to you, right? If it feels compelling to you, that's the story you need to be reading. You can trust yourself. And I love that you guys are the first 50 pages because I have a 50 page rule for myself. Like if I am not hooked in 50 pages, I'm out. Life is too short. Yeah. So I agree. You know, you got to find stuff that resonates. Yeah. I really liked that part in your essay and you kind of touched on it there of like that if 
you know, like you're able to experience, you know, maybe stuff that you need to learn or you want to try, but in like a safe way that it like it's fictional. You're not totally just like throwing yourself off the deep end into learning something or trying something like you can experience it and kind of maybe put your toe in the water and be like, okay, is this, you know, what I need to be doing, what I'm learning. And I just thought that should be, I guess, obvious, but it's not. So then to like read it in your essay, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not real, but your mind makes it real, right? It's like the matrix. Yeah. It's like virtual reality for people. <laughs> and I think those stories stay with you. You know, not only do we, you know, we have that experience while reading the book, but it stays with you over time, um, which is part of the magic that, you know, you use the word magic for sure. Um, you know, Kelsey and I, I, I have to kind of plug your books a little bit because Kelsey is a romance reader yeah. and I am, you know, feet to the fire romance. I am not a romance lover. <laughs> I don't know if in my life I just feel too cynical oftentimes, but your books to me ha are different because there is that, um, you know, there is the romance element of it, but it's, I, I don't know if it's the point of view that you bring to the stories that is, I don't know, to me more realistic or, um, you know, there is a struggle. Um, you know, it's not, you know, rainbows and puppies and, you know, <laughs> perfect lives. There's a struggle. There's, you know, internal doubt and, um, you know, overcoming and, you know, building a life when things have been, you know, either, you know, taken or out and destroyed or out of control or because we all ha get knocked down. There are always those moments. And, um, you know, I have to say one of the, my favorite things that I have read besides read the read for joy essay. Um, so I, uh, the epilogue, um, in happiness for beginners is probably one of my favorite things that I've ever read. Um, and if your listeners haven't read Happiness for Beginners, um, so here was my journey. So I finished What You Wish For, and it was, you know, I'm like, I want to read more. I want to read more of what you've written. You know, I'm just like, I, I'm going to, I've, I've read these. I'm, I'm going to go backwards and read older books that you've written. So I picked up Happiness for Beginners, and like the first 10 pages, I'm like, wait a minute, she wouldn't name a character Duncan if it wasn't, like, what? she wouldn't have two characters named Duncan. And so I'm like, it is Duncan. It's the Duncan from the, the other books. I'm like, these are the characters from what you wish for. And I'm like, what a treat. Um, and so you visit these characters in Happiness for Beginners that were in what you wish for, but earlier in their life. Um, and so then the whole time I'm reading Happiness for, Ginner, for Beginners, I know what happens in the future. Um, like I know what's going to like happen, but it made it all the more compelling for me to keep reading and then I get to the epilogue and it was just, it was perfect to me. It was beautiful. And it really was just what I needed to read at that moment. And so I think you, you know, it was, it was fantastic. So that's my, my plug for those books. I, I, I love your books. I would say that my books are sort of, they're sort of half love story, half personal growth, right? Half deep thoughts about humanity and struggle and going through hard things. And here's the thing, you know, one of the things that I always think a lot about what, how a book pulls you through it. Like how does a book keep you hooked from the, the first page to the end? Um, and there are a lot of techniques that writers use for doing this. One of them is to make you worry about the characters, right? So as you're writing, as a writer, you throw in little hints, you know, little tiny, snippets of information that the reader is reading along and picking up like, oh, like, uh-oh. And then, you know, frequently what they're doing is giving you stuff to worry about. So you're reading along and you're thinking, oh my God, that man's going to have a heart attack, right? Or you're, you're reading along and you think, oh, that kid, that kid's going to go to jail, you know, and you're worried about them. And so you keep reading just to make sure they're okay, right? You're, you're, you're reading, but you're worried. And what I've discovered in my adult life as a parent is that I really, really hate the feeling of being worried. 
there's way too much of that in grown up life. I never, ever anticipated how much I was going to worry about every single person I know and love as an adult. I'm a championship worrier. And so when I have free time, right, and a hot bubble bath to get into, the last thing I want to do is sign up for a book that's going to make me worry more. Like, that's not a vacation for me. So I've thought a lot about, like, romance novels, for example, were like a big eye opener for me because what pulls you through a romance novel is not dread. What pulls you through a romance novel is a pleasant sense of anticipation, right? You, you're guaranteed a happy ending. You know something good's gonna happen at the end. No matter how bad things are at the beginning, you know somebody's gonna take their shirt off by the time <laughs> we're done, right? Good things are coming. So it's a whole different kind of reading experience. And I really thought about that a lot when I first started reading romance novels because I, I was like, what's going on with me? Like, I, this is the only thing I ever wanna read ever for the rest of my life was kind of my initial reaction and still going strong. And I, I wrote about it, I kept a journal, I tried to analyze what was happening and what I decided is I love that feeling of having something to look forward to. And so one of the reasons why you will never ever read a book by me that does not have a love story in it is because the love story is the something to look forward to, right? The love story is the thing that pulls you happily towards something better. I always wanted to be 50-50 in terms of light and darkness. Like actually when I was writing How to Walk Away, I had a day when I had a really intense conversation with my editor, who I adore, where I said, we were talking about how to end the story, we were talking about things to linger on in the story, and I was um, saying to her, you know, I just wanna get the ratio right. I don't want the darkness to subsume the light. That was my worry. Because I tend, like in my life, I tend towards comedy. Well, it's both actually. I'm sort of half comedy, half tragedy. But she said, if you do it right, the darkness will define the light. So I love to write banter and dialogue. I love to write comic situations. I'm actually writing a new book. I was writing yesterday and I wrote a scene where I was cracking up. I was typing at my computer and cracking up because it was so funny what these people were saying to each other. I love that. That's the light, right? The love story is the light. The banter is the light. But, I, but the darkness is also just as important. And I want to make sure the ratio is good. You know, when Happiness for Beginners first came out, they put a... Um, they put a cover on it that had a hiker because it's about a woman who goes hiking. Yeah. And I was very against the cover because I was like, look, y'all, this is not really a hiking book. I mean, it is, but it's really not, right? And yeah. um, I was like, hikers are going to pick up this book <laughs> and be disappointed, right? And um, that actually was one of the very first reviews that popped up for the book was from a man who read it. And his whole assessment of the book was too much kissing, not enough hiking, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I will tell you though that I I will never step on a felled log. I will <laughs> never do that. I'm like I I even told my husband I'm like you know you should never do this if you're hiking in the woods. <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously there is height there is hiking yeah. and there are things to learn. But it was kind of depressing to get that review. It validated all my fears about the cover, but it also was hilarious and it has become like a like a thing now that um you know whenever I like watch a TV show and there's kind of a love story in the TV show, but it's also about, you know, cops solving a murder, you know, I'll get to the end and my husband will be like, well, what'd you think? And I'll be like, too much murder, not enough kissing, right? I'm always now look, I mean, it was actually helpful to me. I'm always looking at the ratio between the good stuff and the stuff that you just have to sit through to get back to the good stuff. Yeah, you have done a TED Talk and we kind of alluded um, to that and it's about empathy, um, and having boys, you know, encouraging boys to read stories from a female point of view. And I love where you say, and, and I think about this in our own professional world, like people come in and they ask for book recommendations. Like we can build up the story, you know, it's about, I think you said like a dragon and it's a super awesome quest. And, you know, the kid's not going to say, well, what's the gender of the protagonist? <laughs> <laughs> that really stuck with me because I'm like, yes, you know, 
And I'm really going to, I, I've really internalized that. And I'm really going to think about that as I'm recommending books. But, you know, your, your TED Talk was about empathy and, and it was um, really fantastic also. Um, and you can, um, you know, find the TED Talk on your website. Your website is amazing. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, it is joyful. So I designed that website. I, I asked somebody to do a website for me and it was so expensive that I almost fell over. And I was like, okay, this is not rocket, rocket science. I can figure this out. And so I, I went and did it. And now it's like, I'm kind of proud of it, actually. Thank you. It is one of the most beautiful websites. So I, and and oh. I want to go back and explore and find new things. And I actually just found, I did not know there was a bridge story between yes. um, how to walk away and things you save in a fire. And so I'm trying to carve out now an hour of time so that I can you know, listen to this bridge story. I'm super excited to yes. know that that exists. Um, and um, so, yeah, I definitely, you know, for more on Catherine, you know, I want to, you know, you know, definitely listeners should visit her website. Um, and you also have a newsletter that I just signed up for. Um, and I love the name Three Good Things. Um, and it's joy delivered to your inbox. And um, do you want to talk about what you're doing with that, Catherine? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, so yeah, I have this newsletter called Three Good Things. And it got started because when I first uh, was sort of, when I first started uh, visiting book clubs back in 2007, when my first book came out, I would go to all over Houston, which is, you know, the fourth largest city in the country. And I would visit all these book clubs and we'd have a great time, you know, and we'd eat cupcakes and then it would be over and I would leave and we would never stay in touch. Like I didn't, get any contact info and I just kind of I guess I assumed that Facebook was going to keep us together I don't, I don't know but then what started happening as the years went by was I would run into these people around town like I'd be in the grocery store and a lady would come up and hug me and say oh it's so great to see you you came to my book club five years ago I loved your book did you ever write anything else <laughs> right and I'd be like oh I wrote four more books you know or whatever it was can you uh like I wish I had kept in touch with you so I started started to occur to me, I'm not like a genius. It started to occur to me after a while that I probably should keep in touch with people so they would know when new books were coming out. And you can't just send a newsletter like every two years because um, people forget that they signed up and then they feel like you're spam. So you, you kind of have to stay in some regular touch. But honestly, I just don't have that much news, right? Like, what did I do today? I made dinner and I eavesdropped on imaginary people talking. I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's not that newsworthy. So I, came up with this idea that what I would do is um, write a newsletter that I would send out four times a year and that it would be recommendations of cool stuff that I had found. And if I had any news, I'd throw that at the bottom, but that for the most part, it was really going to be about, I found this great podcast. I found this amazing new song. You know, I found this uh, beautiful, hilarious rom-com. And um, I, I am a person who totally falls in love with things. Like that is my personality. I fall in love with stuff. I get obsessed with it. And then when that happens, the only thing I want to do is talk about it. Like to anyone who will listen, it's really, it's a burden for my family, honestly. Like they, I'm just like, let me tell you about this. So the idea of getting to channel that into um, a newsletter has been really, really fun for me. I love it. And I've got a whole big long list on a, on a document on my computer of stuff that I've found that I'm just waiting until I can share it because three good things, I'm limited. Um, but it's become one of my favorite things that I get to do in my job. It's totally different from uh, writing novels, but it's, it's just all about spreading joy and spreading excitement and getting to share cool stuff. And I've really heard a lot of good feedback from people that they loved things that I've recommended to them and it's improved their lives. So yeah, it's, really, it's a very fun newsletter. And let me say, if you come and sign up and give it a try and it doesn't work for you, <laughs> That's okay. Like you can unsubscribe and I will never know. And it won't hurt my feelings. I don't even check. So it's really a very low, you know, low risk kind of thing to do. But I think it's fun. My hope is, my goal is for people to be just delighted when they see one of them show up in their inbox. We do have a fun fact for you. Our copy of your first book, The Bright Side of Disaster, has checked out 103 times. <laughs> I wrote that book when my children were babies and they're both now taller than me. I've got a senior in high school now. So it feels like a thousand years ago 
Um, and a woman wrote to me the other day, she had just read it and she had a question for me about the story. And I was like, I have got no idea. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Really? I was like a little tiny kitten when I wrote that book. I have no clue, no clue. We will be definitely looking forward to reading new things, Catherine. And we, again, are so grateful that you took the time this morning to chat with us. And you ha everyone has permission, right? We're giving them permission to read what they connect with. To, there is no book shame and there is no book guilt. Um, whatever speaks to you, we're going to help you find. Thank you for Thanks, having Catherine. me. It's such a treat. Love to meet you guys. Thank you. Bye.